Let me do a little um, walk around in the space for you. So here, I'm here. Monica. Hello. And Patricia. Hello. 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 And so here, can you see, can you see, this is Abigail Stockinger's piece. Yes. This is the fairy mellow scene. And can somebody stand next to her for scale? Because it's a little, I found that with all of the pictures, it's kind of hard to explain. It's like yeah. here, it's this size. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then this is Austin Lubetkin's piece, his self portrait, which is animated. This is Rachel Ungerer's piece, Disabled Drag is Joy. <laughs> these are pre-arrays. And she takes both of these pictures um, from her wheelchair, which sits in the fully tilted back position. So they're the fully tilted back series. This is Julie Forbush's uh, banners, the pain and suffer banners. And I love how th that sort of notion of making it a celebration, right? Ellen Mansfield piece, breathe in, out. And one of Celeste Tooth's pieces. This was set up for a while at her, their school um, over a staircase that made it impossible for them to get anywhere in a wheelchair, in their wheelchair. Bronte Grimm's work. This is Devour. And those are glittery red skulls that the figure is eating. I don't know if you can see that as clearly from here. Elizabeth Raz Charks. Um, she's been doing a whole series of portraiture of disabled people, including um, boudoir photography, which I think is amazing. Yes. Emmy, Emily Cironi's piece, which is, she does collages, and this one is book art. She's been searching out um, older search terms like crippled, handicapped, the things that you don't see as frequently now. And apparently that is Pamela Anderson's arm, the big one. Oh, wow. It looks like she sold yeah. it. I see a red dot. <laughs> Ash Hagerstrand's piece um, on fecal microbial transplants. Um, Ash does all of these pieces that are sort of meant to be experienced online. And so this one, the idea was to try to make something so it has the same experience of coming across something online, but it's a combination of 3D printing and uh, aluminum print. And Patricia Fortledge's work, uh, elixirs, and on the menu. So it's sort of like Dutch masters of medication. This piece is the anxiety coat from Kat Chuddy. And they wanted to have that so that it's um, suspended, but it can actually also be worn. And then Joy, your piece. It's on Clint's The Kiss. That's great, Joy. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. It is a beautiful one. And there's Celeste's piece, uh, Nerves Below Surface, which is uh, acrylic sheets, a small battery powered light. And then Joy's other piece, Desire Seem to Expand. Lisa Marita Pates's piece. I love that she started getting into paper sculpture when she started painting and then got so frustrated with the painting, she shredded it up and then started to say, oh, maybe I could make something else out of that. And then Monica Marx's steampunk wheelchair. All right. She is made for herself so when she can go to those cosplay events, that she can have and can't walk so well, that she can actually enjoy them in style. So, hey, and welcome. And thank you so much for your patience while I figure out what the heck is going on with the Zoom thing. Hi, and welcome. <laughs> um, I'm Laura Brody, and I'm the founder of Opulent Mobility. 
And I am here with Patricia Portlage and one of the Marks from both of them have some wonderful art in the show. Okay. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Sure. Okay. I'm Patricia Portlage. I am a photographic artist. I, well, technically I'm not doing this one, but since COVID and my health, I mean, I'm doing more art, if you will. Uh, I am Monica Marks, and uh, I'm a mixed media and uh, multi, what's the word? We do a lot of different things. <laughs> multi <-hectimate. laughs> We do a lot of different things. Um, I enjoy assemblage, and I enjoy painting, and I enjoy sculpture. Um, and a lot of my work has to do with uh, hidden disabilities and uh, things that, you know, we feel we need to hide. And that includes chronic illness. And hey, and welcome. Um, I'm so glad you could never do this, because this is awesome. really cool. And a lot of people don't really talk about what it means to have a product that is on paper. So not just how it shows up in the work, but what are the things that you have to deal with and shift and change to make your artistic process work? Yeah, you can make things work a little bit easier for you. Because, I mean, it sounds like the documentary thing was so good for you but it's also not a very easy one physically. It was so good for me mentally. I mean, it was challenging because you're dealing with disease and poverty. So it was challenging in that regard, but being a part of a team that was doing that type of work, that's my dream job. Oh, that's great. I'm a worker bee. I would love to be support to good things. And so, yeah, that was really, really good for me. Emotionally and, and and physically too. I was always very athletic and extremely physical, so that was I, I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved traveling to I've been to almost sixty countries and you know, fantastic. Yeah. Um, so this is a little different. <laughs> yeah. This is you know this is um, smaller in the sense of my world became very, very small. Everything now is done in my home studio when I can. The nice part is yeah, I don't need to, you know, lug a lot of gear. There are days when I can't even lift my camera now. So it's, it's a big change, big pivot that I wouldn't have chosen for myself. But there are a lot of there are a lot of good things coming out of this now too. Some artistic abilities I didn't know I had in me. So <clears throat> that's 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 working. Well, it seems like a lot of the skills that you picked up doing all the work with documentary is coming real handy in that for what you're doing now. Well, yeah, it's interesting because when you're working with teams of, of other folks and it's all very quick and you never know in that capacity, am I going to be shooting portraits today? Am I going to be shooting body parts today? Is it going to be landscape? Is there going to be some architecture? So I, and of course I want to make sure that I am doing the best work I possibly can because it's such, you know, good causes and so I really it forced me mm -hmm. to really hone my photography skills yeah so that's coming into play now because I don't really need to focus on my skills as a photographer now I can really focus on the art aspect of it or the message that I'm trying to convey mm -hmm. and so that's that's a big change. And there is some there's some liberation in that, especially since it's my own story yeah. that I'm sharing now, which I wouldn't have chosen because I really don't like to be focused on myself and I don't like being in front of the camera. But it it is my story. And so I have the freedom to tell it like it is. And it and it is what it is. It's um it's simple, I guess you could say, in that regard. Mm -hmm. I do, I, I am involved with a number of different health forums, 
And so I know there are millions of other women that suffer from the same conditions that I do. Yeah. And I do want to make sure that I'm doing right by them as well. So there is some pressure there to, you know, do the research and talk to the people and, and get the feedback and, and, you know, make sure that, yes, I'm telling my story, but it, it's kind of the story of millions of other women. So mm -hmm. I want to be sure that I'm doing right by them. As yeah. Well. But you're also turning yourself into the subject of your own documentary. I am. I am. I am. Yeah. And you know, which is a weird thing to do. Well, it is because I find that I can easily get off on these tangents. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I can't relate to that at all. I, I, I would, no, nothing about that. Well, you know, some days you, you come back from a doctor's appointment where they just treated you like a little five year old girl, like they're there, honey, you know, mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. of a sudden, your art takes this <laughs> tangent into medical profession, you know? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Well, and it's yeah. fair. But so many other people are experiencing it. And I really do think that when you start going into the more personal, that sometimes it's weird that that is more universal. That that means somebody right. can actually relate to it right. because somebody will have some kind of experience that is similar. Yeah, but that is an interesting yeah. that is an interesting question that I find myself asking all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, when something happens, and I think, okay, well, this is part of my story. How am I going to incorporate this? And then I think, well, wait, should I incorporate this? For example, last week I lost a friend of mine. Uh, I'm so sorry. Tumor. Thank you. He it happened very quickly, and he was awful. And Obviously, and I found myself crying. I cried. I cried for days, and I cried for him for the suffering that he experienced. And I, I cried with happy tears that he's now in peace. I cried for his family, and then I found myself really crying for me, which I know sounds selfish, but it was true. I was crying for me. I was a little bit jealous. We don't have medical assistance in dying in this country. It's just mm. it's not accepted. And yet there are those of us who have been suffering for so long and have been suffocating under these chronic diseases and would like that opportunity. Not to say that I will necessarily take it, but I cried for myself mm. because... And I wish I could have traded places with him because he just had so much to live for and, and all of that. And I've had this thing for 18 years now. I'm pretty much homebound at this point, you know? And so I thought about this and I thought, I do know other people with similar situations. We've talked about this medical assistance and dying and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, so I really would like to incorporate this into my project. And I, do I? I mean, that's something you have to figure out, you know, because that's that's always a tricky thing. Um, that's a really tricky topic. And so that is something that I have to think about when I'm working through what to include, what not to do, how to improve it, if I do, you know. So it's not, it's not so straightforward as Oh well, today I'm feeling like this. Let me take a selfie. And there's the <laughs> you know what I mean? and yeah. how I'm feeling like this. Or oh look at what just happened to me. Let me take a picture of it. It's you know, it's just a lot more depth than that. And a lot more research goes into it and the thought process and talking with others and yeah. like that. So. Of course. Have you found that with any of your things? That sometimes you're questioning what it is that you put into the work or how that might be perceived. For the most part, if it's about myself, I I don't care as much. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, just, it's yours. It's your story. It's, right. And I have I have had people who looked at my art and said, um, "Do you feel but Does this make you uncomfortable that you're you're out there so much? That like you're so um, revealing about either the neurodiversity." 
or the uh, physical issues or you know all these things and I'm not but a lot of my art has also come the come from the more severe illness of my daughter and I have to tread lightly there mm. that it's about my experience mothering a medically complex child, not not her story. I can't tell her story. I can only tell my story. So to really, I really have to be aware of where that line is. Yeah. I'm also writing a book about it, so I have, I'm I'm focused on that a lot about where is where is it my story and and be authentic that I stay on my side of my story. Yeah, because that's really tricky. It can be. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. But but my stuff, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> it is. Well, it is your one. <laughs> it's your story. Well, it's your story. I mean, you get to yeah, do that. I don't, and and um, people will, you know, one of my goals in the art I create is that other people feel seen and heard. And to represent in my art things that I didn't see growing up and I didn't feel seen and heard. Mm. Mm. That's really powerful. It is. Thank you. Well, it's a great way to... Well, for both of you to get strength um, uh, with the type of work you're doing now, even whether whether or not physically that's a challenge, you can do it in, with your story elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize you were writing a book too. I am. Congratulations. I, I, How's it going? I well, luckily I'm I'm in a class a workshop. Okay. That meets every Wednesday night. Um, it's run by Stephanie Wilder Taylor, and she's an author, and she has a new book out too. And, and fun fact, I met her when we were children, and we were friends as children too. Oh, neat. If I didn't have the class, I don't have the self discipline oh. to do this at all. But I have to have something written by every Wednesday night. So little by little, <laughs> you know, it's getting, accountability it, makes a big it difference. Makes such a big difference. I I need that. I need deadlines, or I'll just flounder. So. Um, so it's just interesting to have it come out in a couple different creative ways. That I'm, I'm writing this book about my experience, and then it you know comes out in the art as well. Have you found that it's been affecting the way that you make your art? Oh, writing the book? Yeah. Do you yes. work? Think about it differently. Um, I, I just I find my artistic uh, the way that I work is different on my art versus my writing. And versus different kinds of it. So it's like, oh, yeah, the yeah. process is very different. It, I it didn't is. know. It, it is, it is. I think it is. And um, it's it's such a different way of telling a story. Oh, yeah. And it's interesting, though, the way I write, the feedback I get is that I'm painting a picture with my words. Perfect. And I'm like, wow, that's 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 very much what I, mean, I want. Fitting, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I guess my writing style is very artistic. Nice. In that way. That's the feedback I get. That's actually really great. I love it when I <laughs> Does your art ever form the way? You know, they're not always, they don't always meet up. Okay. You know, so sometimes my art is about something I'm going through right now, but the story is about something that happened five years ago. Got it. So, you Got know, it. The, the book is, is a little more linear. Although I will jump around because I'm tired of writing about this part. I'm going to write about a different part. Um, I think the art is more present in the now, and the book is more reflective of the history. Sure. But who knows? Maybe I'll also create some art to go with the book and have that. That would make complete sense. It would be really cool. It would. And I have, I have a few pieces, I think, that would already work. So uh, we're going to show. I think that. you should do that. I, Definitely that do that. That's amazing. Why not? I so. um, yes, I, I have a, I have a piece that I was showing Patricia called uh, "Chronic Means Forever," and um, that came out of after my daughter was hospitalized mm -hmm. this one time, um, and people would say, "Oh, aren't you glad she's better now and out of the hospital?" And mm. <laughs> I'm like, yes, and. <laughs> I was like, let me explain what chronic means. <laughs> you don't get over it. It's not, I mean, she's I guess, better because she's not in the hospital. Um, she's not dying at the moment. Um, yeah. That's, that's Positive. 
in that way. Yes, um, and she, she's now you know living a life, but it's um, I don't think people get that the chronic means forever. It's such an important message, and I'm glad that you, as as difficult as it is in the moment, because I've certainly been there as well. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that you took the moment to explain it, even if in your head, like I usually am, like okay, um, <laughs> you know. I I think it's I, people just don't know, and it's not their fault that they don't know, right? And so every opportunity that we have to share with them these realities, I think is so important. I really appreciate that you were doing that. I'm sad that you are in situations where you have to do that, but, right. Same. but yes. I yeah. appreciate that you are helping to educate people because I think it's it's needed. It's really, really, really needed. I do too, I do too. I, um, I'm friends with a therapist who works with the Immune Deficiency Foundation, which is a foundation we've been a part of for a while because what we have are immune deficiencies, which is mm -hmm. different than autoimmune deficiencies. I have to explain that one a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she, when I got my diagnosis, she said, welcome to the club that no one wants to be a part of. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it's less fun. Yeah, and like you would say, it's not something you would have chosen for yourself, Yeah, but when I was diagnosed, the doctor told me, um, We've got mycelia gravis. It's going to come with a few other things. And I'm really sorry you're going to have to deal with the medical profession now. He knew. That's honest. He yeah. knew. Well, yeah. I didn't know exactly what he meant. At that but point, but I didn't now you know. Yeah. yeah. And for if you have to, um, I mean, we all. Like we're all the center of our own universes. Um, but it really, one of the things I love best about doing this is it really does expose people to entirely different ways of approaching the world because everyone has their own individual experience. But you're a little more likely in the disability sphere to have similar ones. You know? Oh, and, and medical, I'm forgetting exactly what it's called, but basically, Medical PTSD is totally a thing. So much, thing. so much a thing because of all the years of misdiagnosis or not being heard and or gaslighting. And gaslighting. Oh my gosh, so much. It's so frustrating. Yeah, yeah, and especially when you have something that not a lot of the medical profession know about. I mean, it's something they talk about in the IDF or rare diseases in general is about you know the mascot's a zebra because doctors are taught when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, yes. not zebra. Look for the most common thing. Don't look for a rare disease. It's not the TV show house, mm -hmm. right? But it kind of should be a little more because, you know, so the, the slogan is think zebra. You know, rare diseases exist and they need to be looked at also. You need to well, test so for many of them aren't even rare. They're just yeah. rarely understood. <laughs> yes, I love that. Yes, right? I love that. So, yeah, yeah that's a... I'm trying to just maintain composure over here and not go off on. You this. don't have to. <laughs> don't. I could pretty much sure that all of us have probably had some experiences. I know I'm sure I have. Yeah. Um, Hashimoto's, which is you know hypothyroidism, is pretty common. Know the amount of gaslighting I got before I got my just It's ridiculous. And I had to actually go and circumvent people and get tested by different doctors because right. the main doctors wouldn't believe me. Refuse to test Go to, that. yeah. Yeah, no, it's not, you probably don't have that. I'm not gonna waste your time. Yeah, I'm not gonna waste your time. Yeah. I did, you know, for changing medication, for doing all the rest of it, um, for the, the chemical sensitivities that I have, which have been brought on from the years of costuming, which one of our audience members, that's also a fellow costume person, but years of that, like I, I know I can't work with some of the things. And so I'll end up being the obnoxious loud mouth telling everyone you've got to wear your respirators or I can't work in that space anymore. Yeah. And it does, it sort of affects, it affects your ability to do other things. But some of those are ordinary. Those are normal. And yet. And yet. We, and yet. We, and yet. <laughs> you know, we spend so much time trying to educate doctors um, on these things. And Basic stuff. Yeah, and it would be one thing if 
they were open to that and said, gosh, you know, I just don't know. I don't know about, about this. But instead, we get this, oh, that's so rare. It's dismissed. Yeah. My favorite, I had this recently. Fair yes. <laughs> my, favorite, my favorite one happened recently. He literally said to me, that is so rare. I'm sure you don't have it. That's the kind of weaponization that happens out there. Constantly. Like, do you think that's a compliment? What are you talking about? Yeah, it's just, it's, I, that's the part that really befuddles me. I love that word. Mm. Got to use it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is that, why not just say, I don't know? I mean, the human body is the most intricate computer system we could ever imagine, right? Mm -hmm. I'm different from you, you're different from you, you today are different from you tomorrow. So this inherent variability, it would make sense that doctors wouldn't know even a small percentage of the human body, let alone the whole thing. So why is it not okay for them to just say, you know what, I don't know. Or they spent 30 minutes on that in medical school. So I, you know, let me take some time on that or let me get you with somebody. That is not what happens. It's almost like that is trained out of them. Oh, some of it is. Actively. And they're basically told to, you know, be Make arrogant and prevent medical liability. Forget the possibility of us getting sued, the possibility of the insurance company not covering things, but also admitting that most of the doctrine is incredibly basic and it is not all that well formed. It was what, only in the 90s that they started actually using living women yeah. <laughs> yeah. as actual samples? Mm -hmm. well, right. And you examples? Couple, you couple um, there's so the sheer amount of medical racism, which I mean, it is horrific. Yeah. The amount of crap that has gone through with medical that is supposedly medical science. Right. And, you know, there's a joke about that that a lot of science advances one death at a time, you know, because sometimes it's, yeah. it's ego. And doctors are human. And they screw up like everybody else. <laughs> I mean, and they're not they're not really given all of the tools and time they need yeah. either. I mean, like, medical right? school they, is they a see mess. Some patients it's a and, mess. Um, right. Well, you go to medical school with the basics, and you get into your you know your specialty, and there you've got the basics, and then and then you're forced to see what the patient every 15 to 20 right. minutes by the end of the day you see what 30 and you can't people. Think. you're not going to go then and research oh that seventh patient i had today <laughs> let me go look up but let me you know familiarize myself with that condition and what's going on and let me see how i can help that person no they're exhausted so the basics say the basics and it's not really their fault i mean no, but the arrogance is incredibly frustrating. I mean, yeah, you know, so it's you know, you have to talk about the insurance companies and all of this oh, because yeah. they are the driver, and they determine who doctors see, they sure. determine who patients see, mm -hmm. they determine how much time you get. And that's basically at the end of the day, and the formulary for what medicines you can have. Right. Yeah. Right. They are in it to make money. Yep. They don't care about how healthy you are or you are or I am. No. Yeah. So, one of one of the people that I worked with from uh, was the 2020 exhibit. Um, she was doing pieces about her son, and one of the pieces was no longer on the formulary, and the sheer amount of fighting he had to get the medication he needed because that was determined. Oh, we don't cover that anymore. Right. No, because right. it wasn't cost effective for the insurance yeah. company. Uh, they want uh, you healthy or dead. I'm sorry, but yeah. that that's the business that they are It's their in. business that model. That is their business model. Yes. And essentially, uh, yeah, once you reach a certain point, they're like, because certainly menopause is not well studied at oh, all. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a whole nother topic of conversation. But I mean, this is Reminds me of my, my son has celiac disease. Mm -hmm. And in some countries, um, and I don't ask me which ones, but I have heard that gluten-free food is prescribed. And they don't have to pay after 
out of pocket. Yeah. And here, when I ask for, you know, why aren't you selling this gluten-free item anymore? It's because it wasn't cost effective. Not mm -hmm. enough people were buying it mm -hmm. because not everyone, I guess it's not a fad anymore. So it's not as popular. And so it becomes harder to find gluten-free foods in some ways. Um, it, it's just so backwards. It's, it's a mess. It's just a mess. And one thing I really like about what we can do with art is that it starts bringing up these conversations in ways that I think more people can experience them and because it hits you here, <laughs> you know, it really. I think that's the goal for me is, well, the bottom line goal for me is I want people to go hug their loved ones that are suffering from chronic disease or disability because it is so hard. And like you said, People don't know that. Yeah. You just, we just, and especially you're living in your own disability, mm -hmm. right? I just, I just want people to better understand. I mean, I would like to think that the more we communicate, that maybe the medical profession will, you know, change. Maybe we can start to steer that ship a little bit. But mainly, I mean, even just in our communities, the way. The way I'm treated when I park in a disabled parking space, I have people have spit on me. <laughs> like, like, what benefit do you think I'm getting that is that calls for you to be so angry that you would spit on me? And oh, by the way, I'll trade you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'll give you my space. You give me your help. I'll give you my space. Yeah, unless you like, I have a wheelchair. Then people don't, they don't see it. Oh, and if you. And heaven forfend you be partially ambulatory if you do have one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so you don't need a creeping. <laughs> and they're like, who is going to. What exactly? Have you ever had to experience going through the med school system yeah. with a disability? No one's thinking this. Yeah. No one's getting some special oh, yeah. fancy no, thing. Agree. I'm faking this all the time. Well, yes, but you're faking being, being well. Faking, faking being, being well, well all the time. Because once people learn that I have this chronic, ongoing, lifelong, life-threatening condition, now all of a sudden I'm not so fun because I can't just do things when oh. they want to do things, or I... I've all of a sudden lost all intelligence. That's one of my favorite things. It's all of a sudden like I've had no lived experiences, so I'm I'm you know boring or yeah, it's just it's it's this whole thing. And so I really I I fake it well, I think. <laughs> I really work, You're doing a good job. I work really hard at trying to appear as though I'm not sick because doctors treat me differently. I, I come in like this and I, you know, I put on my old corporate mergers and acquisitions hat and I say, okay, here's the data. What are we gonna do about it? What's our action plan? That gets a whole different response than if I am in a really horrible flare one day and have to have somebody take me into the doctor and, and just say, help me. So yeah, I'm faking it. I am faking it, people. <laughs> there you go. A mask. This is a mask. This is a I, mask. Um, one of the things I've done since, well, I have a I have a rare disability too that started when I was 16 and wasn't diagnosed until I was in my late 40s. So it, it's been a, a crazy journey, but it's a degenerative disorder. But um, one of the things we have, I have a problem with is we don't see ourselves reflected anywhere, which is what's so exciting about the work you guys are doing and, and the work of the show in general. But it's, it's, I don't know why I've never looked it up before, but there are 1.3 billion people in the world who have significant disabilities. That's 16% of the population. But I don't think 16% of the media or of art or of anything. Far from it. And I'm trying to think of the last time 
I went to an art show that wasn't about disability, where anyone who was disabled was portrayed. Um, of it's course, rare. you know, the, and the artists, of course, there are the invisible disabilities, so we don't know. You know, everybody is sick in some way. They have something going wrong, but we're all faking it to a certain extent because we have this image of what we should be and how we should present ourselves. Yeah. But uh, I just wondered if you guys would talk about that for a little bit. You know, how do we, how do we, because society has blinders on. It's like, how do we knock those blinders off? How do we it's kind of like, Aging was easier for has been easier for me because I'm already used to not being seen. It's like as you age, people just kind of stop seeing you in the same way they do as when you're young. So, but still, it's like, how do we do it? You know, of course, we're doing it through visual art. We're doing it this way. There are actually a lot of people doing that in a bunch of different ways, which I actually, um, if you're at all interested um, later on, I can send everybody a list of some of the people I've been following on Instagram. Um, if, you, if you're into the TikTok, there's also those. Um, I, I have not been, but um, there are a lot of people who do the both. The TikTok. That was, that was kind of a revealing <laughs> that you're not. Yeah. <laughs> the interwebs. <laughs> but, yeah, well, they are doing a lot to to make us visible. People yeah. are are being very, very, very brave and and in getting yeah. out there and saying this is this is what reality looks like. It's not what we've been watching yeah. from Hollywood all along. Yeah. But there's still I, so much blindness. I mean, yeah, to to use to use the unableism. Um, there is a lot. There are a lot of different options too. And I, I think that um, we were talking about this yesterday in the, the talk with Anthony, that you see a lot of um, disability art that is either incredibly serious or, or that it's much more about, you know, essentially get to, get to know disability, you know? Or you see the stuff which is, oh, those poor little people. And you're not seeing a lot that's celebratory. And I think that that's, that's right. one of the things, one of the reasons why I put these together. But also because it's an excellent way to communicate with people who don't think they're disabled. Right. Technically speaking, right. I didn't really associate myself that way until I was putting something into a show. And I was like, so, you know, you should be in this book that's on disabled art. And I'm like, well, I guess tech, I was joking about it. Like, I'm not disabled enough to be disabled. She's like, all of your conditions are listed yeah. in the ADA. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I will, yeah, because, uh, because what I have is not as serious as what my daughter has. And I will discount my own experience because hers is worse. Or, you know, and so we... You know, or, or, you know, well, I'm not as disabled as you are, so, you know, do I have a right to say that I have disabilities? Or, you know, it's like a c compare, because that's what we do in our society. We do. Everything is, it's better or worse than something or someone else. Instead of just being, this is me, this is my reality, this is what I have, and, and that's just my, my truth. And I think that that's one of the things that this is actually really good at, and good about explaining to the rest of the world uh, Oh, what this means that disability can cross those borders, you know. Yeah, yeah we, we are a temporarily able bodied people. <laughs> That's what right. we are. Right. <laughs> That's all it is. But yeah, I mean, look, I recognize that there, I have privilege on different levels. And part of those privileges are that I don't have, say, disability that is more frequently um, discriminated against. I'm not generally losing my job as a result of it. You know, there, right. there are certain things, but there are also certain things like I can tell you when I am making it look like things are going better, yeah. you know? And no, a lot of the work that I used to do, I can't do anymore. You know, it's interesting you know, like, what I heard of okay. um, some in the disability community talking about during the pandemic was all those years you said that working from home uh, remote work was not possible 
for people with Lies. disabilities. <laughs> and then, you know, we all have that. <laughs> it is possible because that's what happened during the pandemic. But now the pendulum is swinging back a little bit because some companies are saying you must come in so many days a week. Yeah, and I think that first off, fighting against that is important. And we have to really talk about that. Um, but second off, that, that's a lot more real estate. Let's not mm -hmm. lie. That's a lot of people saying, we have expensive office buildings. We yeah. do not want to uh, not be making that money on. We don't want to be not having which is, that. Which is interesting. Which because... is also gross. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, you can save so much for your company and by not doing that. And that's that. what they were noticing at the beginning of the pandemic was, wow, look at those occupancy costs we could save. Yeah. You know? But and also, so look, like, sure, there's ahead. a lot of mid-level managers who are like, I'm going to be out of job. <laughs> well, then there are a lot of managers that aren't really savvy enough to understand how to measure work productivity. They still have yeah, to see it. They have to see yeah, yeah, people yeah. working. And it's so old school. It's so outdated. It's so nonsense is what it is. So, you know, you would think that if you, you compared that to the occupancy costs that they're saving, it would be a no-brainer. Oh. And now we're so entrenched in this old, no, I, I don't think that you're working I, unless I can see you, you know, unless, or I heard you mention laundry. You're doing your laundry while you're working? Well, of course, who couldn't do their laundry while they're putting in a productive <laughs> hour thing? I mean, you yeah. know, it's just this archaic sort of way of thinking. Um, so much of that's what it's it's a very junior high school. <laughs> it's very so junior. much of it is. And it's all the, the capitalism that kind of rules everything. Yeah, but also the uh, I'm not important enough if, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not telling you what to do if I can't see you in order to. Right. Yeah. Which is bizarre. I don't know. You're like, okay, so maybe they're cheating and not sitting there with their eyes fully open in every single Zoom meeting. Or, <laughs> or seriously. And? and? On so, a serious note, let's say somebody does take advantage of it. Yeah, and that, that could happen. Well, okay, manager, do your job. Yeah. To address that, don't punish the entire population for something that one or two people may or may not be doing or will do. Yeah. It's that's just that's not a leader. No, that's not leadership. Yeah, and, and like I don't want to deny the very real issue that a lot of people had the loneliness, which is, it's yeah. been pretty significant for a lot of people. Yeah, but we've got to find better ways to handle that that are not just either or either or or essentially having to rely on your workplace to provide your own socialization. It's like. We might want to rethink how we're treating work. Well, and if that's the, if that's our choice, I think also people with chronic illness, yeah, miss out on yeah. a lot of so often. There's been so many things that um, I'm just pointing because my husband's over there. That, you know, <laughs> like, hey, this looks like a really fun event. Let's go. And he said, oh, COVID numbers are going up, and you know, I can't be around that. You so, can't be around that. You can't, you might have to do things with the kids that you have to do for caretaking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the whole mask wearing, and we don't have to go into it too much, but, you know, I was wearing, well, our family was wearing masks on airplanes before it was popular, I'll say. Oh, yes. <laughs> before it was the cool <laughs> thing. <laughs> <that were. laughs> Oh, we're uh, in. Uh, before the cool we kids were doing the Vogue it. mask company way before other people did. Um, <laughs> in fact, I had this one great experience when I was wearing a black, uh, it's just the company I like is Vogue mask. Um, and, um, ooh, maybe see this, I'll send me a few minutes. And, um, <laughs> Let's find out. And I had the black one on and uh, there was this really little kid and I was waiting for the flight and he said, you look like a ninja. And I was like, I am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I totally played it up. Um, but then the backlash against people wearing masks. And you know, why are you still wearing? I mean, we would have people say stuff to us. 
when we're wearing masks. Yes. But yeah. you know, I don't want to wear a carry a sign. We are being compromised. You know, because it doesn't matter. It does. You shouldn't it, have to explain like you parking in yep. you know the, in your parking spot. It's oh like, yeah. No, I get out. I'm all dressed anymore. up because I had to. You know, I had a fun event that I lasted five minutes for. Oh, oh you're dressed up. You couldn't possibly be disabled because apparently we're all supposed to look like. Here, you know, at the depths of poverty, which, believe you me, would be medical expenses. Yeah, it's happening. Yeah, yeah what I, I have found is because. Um, we're, we're living in a space where so few people are. Um, it's just important to to take into account. We had a talk in here where we have ASL, and sometimes the clear masks uh, don't actually protect well enough, and that that's not appropriate for people who are deaf or lip reading. So I'm figuring out ways to balance this and also keep health. You know. And I'm fortunate that my immune system is pretty good, but I also got COVID two weeks ago, three weeks ago, yeah, and yeah. for the in time for the opening, which is great. And my my <laughs> sister rolled me around on a laptop around the room. It's though. very on brand. I know. <laughs> for those of us who couldn't attend in person, yeah. So you were welcome to come in. There's food and drink in there okay. around the corner. And uh, it's there's something for like accessibility for Um yes, we have art descriptions for all of the pieces. Um so if you can use the QR codes, they will take you to the individual web pages. And there are descriptions, art descriptions. There are also, if you wish to, they're in the booklet um at the front desk in large print. Um, because yes, I, I think it is always better to have it so you can have them fully described. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you want to wait for a while, I can describe them for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. and you can if you would like. Melusine is my piece, and you are allowed to feel it. Awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Again, there's this is one of the things that happens when you're doing these sorts of shows. Finding ways to deal with multiple access needs is always tricky. And I can't offer everybody's work up to touch. That isn't necessary. I loved I loved that when I was doing fabric art was that people could touch it. Yeah, and we really like so able wonderful. To do that. But not everybody it. Yeah, it's great. Mine isn't really. <laughs> Yeah, yours. Oh, I mean, I photos are not that good for that. They're just not. No, <laughs> no. I. But it's like yeah. different arts have their different, you know, ways of perception. Yeah. But that was, you know, there was a thing going on about whether working with fabric is craft or art, you know. But to me, oh, that is so tiresome. Such, <laughs> I know, like, I know. That's an annoying. It's like, but it's, it's just annoying. And, yeah, and it's it's like we we it's like, something. and it's part of being a person with a disability, and uh, it's like um because it's part of that thing we want to classify and we want a hierarchy of things. You know, I don't know what's in our genetic makeup that makes us so vulnerable to that kind of competition and desire for a hierarchy. But it was just really wonderful to have art that people could touch. And I remember doing um, one piece uh, and in the descriptor, I did little French knots of Braille and a person who was visually impaired helped me figure out how to do it. And it was just, it was just a pure delight. That's wonderful. <laughs> Love that with that. Yeah. Very, very cool. I had an artist do that, um, Annalise Slabe, who's uh, out of Belgium, was doing that with embroidery, but also through puncturing them. So she had these papers, those starch paper collars, and she would puncture them with an awl to get the braille. Oh, it was great. That. It was so neat. That's something that even I could. Yeah, absolutely. Way that I could make my work more accessible. That would be a neat I thing. I thought about that. Yeah, um, one of, you know, People do like the QR codes, but that I love that we can have not only just the basic alt text, which is one a great way to do 
um, descriptions. And if, if you ever want to do that um, for all social media, go to the uh, three dots in the right hand corner and you can you know inspect accessibility features, add alt text, where you can describe the work and find ways to make it, you know, so somebody who is blind or low vision can experience the work. Can you speak to describe the work or do you have to type in? To uh, you, can, the work? you can type in to do that. No, but I think you but, can. The microphone. But there are, my, there are my ways the speech to text. Speech to text works. There's a, there are, um, that can as well, I think. But um, you have to find, you've got to have that function on your device. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I think otter.ai does that. Okay. Otter, like the, the sea mammoth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, what I like to do is more long form art descriptions. And so for that, I started doing them myself, but then I brought in Terry Grossman from Otterwise, who's done a great job. So she'll do the full descriptions. I'll come in and then edit them down and make sure that they really are explained in ways that that are capturing all the details that maybe she doesn't see in a photo file. Got it. You know, yeah. um, or that are the things that maybe she misses. But that's you can do that. Like a regular alt text is, you know, maybe a sentence or two. A yeah, full it's... description yeah. is more. So, and that that's always an option if you have that. It can also be a really poetic way of describing your life. Not just a green and bronze ceiling, for example, looking up at a green and bronze ceiling with a light fixture for the completely tilted backs of what it is. But saying this is with painted flowers and details on the wallpaper with what looks like a venting system and crown molding with you know, metal twigs around the light fixture. You can do something that's a lot more evocative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people will joke about that sometimes. They're like, oh, well, they don't even know what blue is. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. They have probably, if you are blind or low vision, you might have had a different points in life had experienced it. I don't know. I haven't heard that before. That's somebody oh, right? to judge, right? Yeah, well, there are people who want to be jerks no matter what. <laughs> this is also true. <laughs> but so how do you think that we could get our art more out into the world. Because I feel like mm -hmm. a goal for me is just to get eyeballs mm -hmm. on my mm -hmm. work. Not because it's great, but because it's opening people's, it's educating people on, yeah. on at least a small portion of what some of us are dealing with. So how do we, so we're making the art, mm -hmm. right? And we're talking about it, which is great. How do we get it out there more? How do we get more people doing it? Like how yeah. how do we get it to the to a point where it can start to tip the scales? I guess it it's almost feels like parallel. Parallel. I like the book. Um, parallel to people with chronic illness who don't feel seen. And the art of that kind of illness is not seen. It, it almost feels like mm. those are parallel paths. Yeah. Um, it, the answer is, I think it depends. And it depends on where you're going. Like I just, I think I told you or shared with you, um, the UC Irvine Health is looking for artists for their health installation. I think that that's a good, it's a good Trace just start looking at places like that. Just start. Which is interesting because I immediately thought about all of the medical centers I've been in. Right? Yeah. Because right. I'm and kind of collecting them at this point. I collect I, them all. I, I, I so much because of my work, right? Yes. So I have, I've had to establish care in about 12 different cities. The art that I'm seeing has nothing to do with us. Yeah, I, I know. I'm always so looking at I saw that places. and I started looking through and I read the perspectives and all of that. It really you wasn't sounding like okay. they want my no, stuff. Yeah, no. I am going to go ahead Just do it anyway. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I but, that for a lot of it, it is. Do it anyway. Yeah. Maybe I, if they see more 
of that, if more of us actually apply with that kind of work, it might make them think differently. Yeah. But yeah. there's also like what Ted Meyer does with Art and Med at USC. Yeah. Um, I know, it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, but there needs to be more of that. I think that making sure that you have the opportunities by simply pushing it. If you can, do it. Um, I'm not saying that everyone has to. It's like, oh, hustle, hustle more. It's like, do it where you can, wherever you can. Um, because if you keep it in the only in the disability sphere, that's will limit you. Absolutely. I think that too, yeah. Well, it's sort of, in, for me anyway, it defeats the purpose of this energy I'm putting forth to yeah. put myself out there. I mean, yeah, I think you know, we want to. You all get it. Yeah. You know, I want it to get to people that. That don't don't yeah and that was the whole reason that I was willing to put myself in front of the camera is I kept thinking we've heard about disabilities our whole lives we know what chronic illnesses are we I mean shoot, we all know Parkinson's disease right but why are things not changing do we need to I mean usually it takes you know getting something yourself or a family member right but hopefully that doesn't need to happen sometimes it takes a celebrity true it can take a celebrity but i wonder it. if just seeing it not reading about it or hearing about it but having a visual to put with it and that's what made me say okay i'm gonna get in front of the camera and show that this is how i have to Put my shoes and socks on. I can't bend over anymore. I can't mm -hmm. squat down. I can't bend over. I've got those grabber tools. Like most people have reading glasses in every room in my house, you know? Mm -hmm. and so maybe if we see pictures, um, I don't know. It can help. It can help a lot. And it also, but I don't think there's any one thing you can do that's going to point to exactly everything that's going to make, make it shift over. But there are a lot more people out there who are doing it now. So I think now is a really good time for it. Um, and I think one of the best things we can do is work together. And find that way we will find and build other opportunities instead of keeping it separate. Yeah. Instead of keeping it small. Say, okay, what can we do when we bond together? Yeah. In all the ways that we can. I think that's great because I'm struggling with have to have the strength and the time to create the art yeah and then i have to have the strength and time to put it out there and if you know if there's a group of us and we're working together then you know maybe that can help me to know oh Patricia, don't even waste your time going down that path the, yeah the return on your investment is very little maybe shift to this, or I tried this, and, you know, that kind of thing. Because I, as they say, I have very few spoons. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just, my battery is very, very tiny, and it doesn't recharge very well. So I have very, very limited hours in the day. And within those limited hours, I have limited strength guidance, you know, what's, what's the biggest bang for my buck, I guess. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And I would say, let's, first off, let's keep in touch. Second off, that's one of the things that social media is actually good for. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and doing and things you're, online. You're talking about community. Also. Yeah. Yes. And building community. Yes. Yeah. And this is what we need to do. Yeah, I agree. Well, just, I, just, really I, just, I just, I just had this thought, which is, I never ask at my doctor's, my various doctor's office why they have that kind of art on their wall you know so maybe that's a better a thing that we can do individually is just say you know there's a lot of art that celebrates uh disability and body differences why don't you try to get some of that in here you know so yeah. we'll have something to look at that uh, Start makes asking. us feel less less alone you know yeah. that it's not just us going through this, but people who have done have done it, and there are beautiful yeah, or you know it. interesting images of it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, yeah I can I can give them links to your art in particular. 
No, I mean, I think first off, it's going to be specific kinds of art. You know that. Yeah. It's, it's going to be the lighter yeah. stuff. We know this. We know this already. Yeah, yeah. But saying, but saying we want to avoid it, it might be helpful for people to go and bring it up and say, hey, I want to see people. I want to see right. our photography for wheelchair users. I want to see this. I don't want to see or experience pretty sunset, pretty sunset. or things that make me not Lots of pretend that nothing is happening. Right. Yeah, it's not distracting anybody. Yeah. I think they think that it's like you you are lying to yourself in every possible way if you think that they're in the hospital not thinking about what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> they know they're not that dumb. But no one's that dumb. Exactly. But well, and it also, I mean, it just it just occurred to me that you know, if you've got art on the walls of a medical center mm -hmm. that show different folks with disabilities, it kind of lends to their credibility that they know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, right. Right. I think this corporate council. Yeah. More often. Well, it, it makes you look like you know what, what you're talking about <laughs> instead of, oh look, I have more pictures of flowers. There's nothing wrong with pictures well, of flowers. We've seen a lot of yes. <laughs> except yeah. of what I, yes. what I like to call noticing pictures. Of flowers. When we walk into a medical center, we're not noticing the art unless it's it's speaking to you personally yes it's flowers sure. whatever i don't even notice but if somebody's in a wheelchair there's like if that's hanging on the wall you know I if your kiss see. is hanging on the wall you're going to pay attention <laughs> yeah you know, if somebody i i was thinking of doing um pictures of say like the jazzy peacock scooter i have that if you did like the little detail shots and then one of the full one of the jazzy peacock mm -hmm. on the walls See? of the pediatric court. Yeah. You yeah. Know, somebody would be like, me. I love you. Yes. <laughs> like somebody loves me and who who might be using a thing. Yeah. Like, my first reaction true. would be, oh my God, they get it here. Yeah. 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 These people can help me potentially, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Yeah. Well, well yeah. yeah. Well, might like to see my steampunk wheelchair and think, oh, I can still do cosplay. Exactly. Uh, one of the well, reasons I've been doing this exhibit is that it's an opportunity to do it as fine art, you know, because a lot, yeah. a lot of the disability um, isn't necessarily put into that category. Right. You know, it can be sometimes it's just not taken as seriously and so it's like it's okay you know just as long as they're disabled and it's like again it's the very look at the isn't it nice here with those people right here? and it's not treated like art which is not great so uh, it matters a lot to have the things be of high quality to have them be thoughtful to have them be layered and to have it be more than just you know, good at cursory glance. Yeah. No, this is amazing. This oh, show that you did. This is it is. And I think getting it it's encouraging to those of us who participate, but also um you know as we've shared that oh I've got some work in the show that other people have started to say, oh wow, you mean there's actually a place for me, there's actually a place for my art, or you know, I think it anything and everything that we can do along these lines will just hopefully help to you know snowball and eventually yeah. you know get more and more people you know and we can build it. And you never know who's who's seeing it, who knows someone else who you know word yeah. of mouth maybe. Or, or word of mouth matters. Yeah, and this, does. this should be in a museum. This, this show. I, we're working on it. Um, but you're doing the kinds of things we're talking about, you yeah. know, getting out there, getting a wider audience, yeah. Yeah. getting seen, getting heard. Yeah, and that that's sort of the goal of this, that it was one thing when I was starting to write the book on this, mm -hmm. and I just, this I, for the 10th anniversary, I'd like to get something done by the end of the year. Again, crossing fingers. But the process of it, I wanted to interview her. And or as many people who wanted to do that, it became really, really clear that it was not just 
we want to do this. We want multiple opportunities. Everybody is like, no, we want more chances to work with each other. We want more chances to have things happen. Speaking of having somebody hold you accountable. Yeah. <laughs> I, also, I have a group of people who are holding me accountable. But personally, I want to say the questions you had with this show, because I kept getting sick. Yeah, well, and that's I the thing. I was able to like, keep saying that. <laughs> She's yeah, amazing. I mean, the last so, show, I showed up and I was literally slumping over on this bench and I had to like grab her. I had fully enough strength to get home right now. I mean, it was horrible. Yeah. It was just so embarrassing. Yeah. So horrible. And you were so, you were like, yeah, I got you. Yeah. And it was like, oh, no big deal. <laughs> Oh, I like, think, oh my God! Right? It was amazing. I know because we're so. I mean, I'll speak. For you. you know, you have to be the drop off and pick up is between this hour and this hour, and if you don't, you know, there's a problem. Or you have to, you know, the, all the, the deadlines are great for accountability, but the rigidity of deadlines not taking into account humans. Humans. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, we're human. Humans. Things don't always work. We don't always have the timeline. And there was that period of time where I was just, I kept getting sick, I kept getting sick, which happens. I mean, I'm very happy right now. Yeah. I know, I'm more frustrated. Did you know, I have to say, I, I'm usually afraid to ask for an exception on those rigid dates. Mm -hmm. I had to with you, and again, you were super gracious. <laughs> but it gave me, it made me realize that you can ask. Not just people that you you think might understand. They think might be nice yeah. about it. Right. You, know, you, you can know. always I mean, ask, and I think that that's something people forget. So I have had to ask in a couple of different situations yeah. that were not this environment at all. And one of them was just super open. Yeah, I'm sure what, you know, what works and we figure something. And the other one was like, uh, and like you could tell they were thinking that's not how this works but they did they worked with me you know so i thought well nothing's gonna change for me if i change it my, you know and so. that's that's part of what we normalize asking for accommodations yep ask for your ask your access needs ask for your accommodations ask for what you need and it could be so intimidating because everything right. dies in darkness, as they say. Yeah. You I know, don't like that word accommodation. So I'm going to be honest with you. I, okay. I have found it to be. I like so access needs. Alienating. Okay. So I just ask for what I need. I don't yeah. even say yeah. why anymore. I just yeah. this is what this is what I need. This is when I need it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that makes it would be better for almost everyone around. Um, for the people who aren't going to work with that, they're probably not people you need to be working with. Yeah. The sad truth is. Um, or you find yourself getting creative and get somebody else to help you. Yeah, know what I mean, yeah. And figure out another way. But at least you asked. Yep. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, and, and I think I might have said, yeah, you know, I've got this condition, so I'm, you know, trying to make that work. But I find if I don't say things like, could you make an accommodation for me or could you make an exception? I just, no, you know, just say it's like a business deal. Yeah. Right? And just this say, is oh, I need. this yeah. is what I need. It's, it's really okay. straightforward. I think that that actually, it's a really good approach well, and you for have a lot to of people. Be willing to walk away. Yes. Yeah. The thing. You have to be willing to say, say no. Okay. You, I, yeah, I can't, I can't make it. I understand you've got a business to run, you know, so no hard feelings. Um, and I apologize. I'm sure you can fill that space, you know, but mm -hmm. my piece would have been in, but, you know, thank you for at least yeah. giving me the opportunity to ask, right? you know, right. and so far I've not had anybody turn me away. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if I'm even if it's because of the surprise that you're asking, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it matters, it matters to have that awareness. And that I think, uh, just to know that in a lot of ways, you are also doing them a favor. You are doing them a favor. You are that. sharing but your work. They would not have a show if you didn't do that. Yeah. It's work on it's an interesting perspective. It's, it's, a, it's, just, it's a shift. It's a shift. Yeah. Now, 
of course, everybody's doing, I, I can honestly say, curating shows is no joke in terms of the workload. Oh, that's, but yeah, I understand but say, yeah. I don't have a show if you don't show up. Yeah. There's a, yeah. It's, it, there's, you are here. I don't got anything. <laughs> so this is. But at we, the same we, time, it's extremely stressful for you too. So I do try to remember that yeah. and, and let them know. I, I try. Know this is. I know you have, you know, this to be set for a on your plate. I, you know, apologize, but is there any way we can, you know, blah blah blah? And actually, one person, one young woman said, she said, oh, I think I have something like that, but I'm not getting any answers from that. <gasps> so you never know. You never know. Exactly. Yeah. And we even said that. She said, Oh, I would never have known. And I said, I would have never known either. And so we had, to, you know, and so. There was one more convert. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and one more person who knows that some, first off, oh, this isn't un that unusual. Somebody else has it. Maybe and look, she asked if and we I, could, you know, make a little slip on the on the date. That was brave. I can be brave too, maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? Yeah, one of the reasons I'm I'm writing the book is is for other parents also who would ask the questions. I wish I had known to ask. Yeah. Um, hey, can you just run an immune panel and see if that comes out? <laughs> you know, just a simple blood test. And and it was never done until she was hospitalized. No one ever checked. Actually, ch I would ask about her immune system. And they would just say, well, you know, kids get sick. Until she almost died in the hospital. And mm -hmm. four days into her stay in the ICU, then they ran an immune panel. So yeah, it's oh. it's like if I knew then what I do now. Um, yeah. So that's one of the reasons I, I advocate so much uh, information, educate as you were saying, um, because I would want other parents and and people too. But my perspective first was as a parent to know that it's okay to ask. To run an immune panel and just see yeah, it's okay. okay. It's more than okay. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we own our own health, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I look at the medical profession as consultants. If I was going to renovate my house or let's build on a, you know, a glassed-in porch or whatever, I would interview architects until I found the right one for the job, right fit with right. me, whatever. That's how I look at doctors. And now you need to, yeah. They've got yeah. their medical degree. I've got this 24 seven and I do my research and I have access to these forums of other folks with similar things. And I have fortunately good friends who are doctors from working overseas. So I can, they help with research or I have access to PubMed or whatever. So I go in you know, with me and all of my data, and I need them to meet me as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And that's how I treat them now. I, I yeah. come yeah. in saying, okay, here's where I'm at. What are your thoughts? I'm thinking we should do this, this, and this. Yeah, it's more a collaboration. Or, right. But, but, but I didn't know that in the beginning. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it took years. Before I realized that, okay, first of all, I'm bringing something, them something they have no idea about. So I need to educate them a little bit first, but I didn't know I could do that in the beginning. Yeah. Right? So, you know, it's very important. Um, I know also that sometimes I look at that, you know, what happens if you're not? What happens if you're not aware? What happens if you haven't done the research and you don't? And to go in, how terrifying is that? When all you're used to doing is following authority. Yeah. And you walk up. Yeah, which is when you need people yes. who, are can, who are willing to question, who have taken those steps. Yeah. And sadly, taken the frustration and anger mm -hmm. of dealing with it to say, here, this is what I went through. So maybe you don't have to. Yeah. Yes. This is super important because not everyone's given that. Everyone gets that option. So let's figure out better ways. Yep. Do you all have any questions? <laughs> just rattle on. Because we're going to just keep rattling on. <laughs> no, we're not, because some of us are wearing down a little. Okay, so. fine. <laughs> but a lot longer in me, but it's okay. Do you all?
Um, Marta or Joy, do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? No, I think it was nope. a brilliant no. talk, though. I think this is great. great. I'm so glad you can all join us. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah, this is this has been really special and very important. I yeah, feel. Yeah. 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 I'm so uh, glad I got to be here and participating. Thank you for yay. inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you don't mind, I would like to be able to archive this and put this up on the YouTube. Did you say oh, the YouTube? The YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's the YouTube. I'm embracing my inner granny. <laughs> Point of it. I'm saying, you, know, you know, like the kids do. <laughs> it's these 